to which we now come. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagements she has planned for the rest of today. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I agree with the Scottish Government that in many cases a community sentence may be the best option in sentencing. But does the First Minister agree with me that the crime of rape should not be among them? First Minister. Uh, I absolutely agree that the crime of rape should be treated with the utmost uh, seriousness and severity. Indeed, statistics show that the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of rape cases, 93% of rape cases incur a custodial sentence and indeed the average length of custodial sentences for rape and attempted rape are now 17% uh, longer than they were back in the year 2006 7 I think all of that is right and proper. Uh, sentencing, of course, in individual cases is a matter for the courts, and it would be wrong for me as First Minister uh, to comment on any individual case. But in terms of community payback orders, uh, these, of course, are a sentencing option available uh, to courts. Uh, however, courts will make those judgments based on recommendations uh, that take into account risk assessments, public protection uh, and the background of the individual. Um, and uh, where a non-custodial sentence is given, uh, the court will have considered all relevant matters uh, in that case. Individuals on uh, community payback orders are also subject to robust and ongoing risk assessment and where appropriate, that will include multi-agency public protection arrangements. Uh, but there's no doubt in my mind, presiding officer, uh, that the offence of rape or indeed attempted rape uh, should be treated with the utmost severity. Ruth Davison. I would like to thank the First Minister for that response. And while she does recognise that 93% uh, of sentences uh, regarding rape incur a custodial sentence, that leaves 7% that don't. And once again this morning, we read of more evidence where that's the case, where these types of crimes are receiving a community payback order, one of this government's key justice policies. And they do include sexual assaults against children and rape and child rape. Now, this morning, Rape Crisis Scotland said that it is difficult to see in what circumstances a CPO could ever be an appropriate sentence for rape or the rape of a young child. Surely everyone here can agree that Rape Crisis is right. First Minister. Uh, well, I've got the utmost uh, respect for the work that Rape Crisis uh, does, and I absolutely agree that their views on all matters of rape and sexual offences should be listened to very seriously. Um, I agree, and I've, I've made that clear, rape is one of the most heinous offences that can be uh, committed in our society. Um, and I believe it is incumbent on all of us and everybody with any influence in the criminal justice system to make sure that the offence of rape is treated seriously. Uh, the simple point I will make, and I, I genuinely hope it's a point that Ruth Davidson uh, will accept, is that as First Minister, I do not decide on the individual sentences uh, passed down by courts. That is uh, rightly and properly a matter for courts. And before a court will make a decision uh, on the appropriate sentence in any case, they will take account of a range of information and circumstances, the risk to the public, uh, and of course the circumstances of the offender, including uh, in many cases the age uh, of the offender. I think it's right in our society that it is courts, uh, the independent judiciary that decide on sentences, but in setting policy, it is very clear to me uh, that we need to treat rape and indeed other sexual offences uh, with the seriousness that they merit. That's why I've pointed to the statistics uh, in terms of uh, rape cases, custodial sentences are passed down in rape cases in a, a higher percentage uh, of, of cases than for almost all other offences. The average length of custodial sentence is now uh, longer. Uh, we are seeing through the criminal proceedings statistics, the Crown Office bringing more successful prosecutions for rape and attempted uh, rape, uh, 125 convictions in 2014-15, which is up from 89 in the year before that. Uh, Police Scotland's also improved the investigation of rape and other sexual crimes, setting up the new National Rape Task Force. So I hope nobody uh, across this chamber would doubt in any sense uh, the seriousness with which we all take these issues. But I equally hope members across the chamber will accept that fundamental point of principle uh, about criminal justice in our society, that it's not politicians who decide sentences in individual cases, it is rightly courts who do so. Ruth Davidson. I would like to thank the First Minister for the response and for the manner in which we're able to discuss it, because these are sensitive issues. And I know that everyone in this chamber is united in our disgust at crimes such as these. But the reason that I raise it today is that concerns with CPOs have been well documented for some time. 
And the Scottish Government says that there are sanctions open to the courts when CPOs are breached. But every year, we discover that nearly a third of orders are broken with scant evidence that people are punished. And we know that one in five of these CPOs are handed out without any work requirement placed on criminals who receive them. Now, I repeat that we on this side of the chamber absolutely accept the need for community sentence, sentencing. But what is the First Minister doing to address these issues of CPOs? Well, I think Ruth Davidson is right to raise this issue generally, and I think she's right uh, to raise the particular uh, issues around non-custodial sentences, because of course we've got to monitor on an ongoing basis the effectiveness of non-custodial sentences like community payback orders. And as I said, I, I think in an earlier answer, uh, individuals uh, on community payback orders are subject to robust and ongoing risk assessment, where a community payback order is breached, it is open to the court uh, to, to introduce different sanctions, including imprisonment for uh, breach of the, the payback order. It's also the case, and this is, I think, very pertinent to the issue of effectiveness of these uh, disposals, which is, is one of the, the issues that Ruth Davidson is raising. Individuals who are released from a custodial sentence of six months or less are reconvicted more than twice as often as those who are given a community payback order instead. Now, what that tells us is that non-custodial uh, sentences like CPOs, uh, when they are handed down in appropriate circumstances, are more effective than short-term prison sentences in reducing re-offending. So I absolutely accept that these are issues of the utmost seriousness, and we've got to look at all of the evidence. But I hope all of us would agree uh, that where it's appropriate, and I absolutely stress where it is appropriate, keeping people out of prison, and I'm not talking here about particular offences, uh, but in general terms, where it's appropriate, keeping people out of prison uh, and helping to rehabilitate them in the community so that they are less likely to re-offend is in general terms a good thing. None of that, absolutely none of that, takes away from the seriousness of certain types of offences, which should, al should always be treated with the utmost seriousness by our courts. Ruth Davison. Well, I think we can all agree that reducing re-offending is important, but people and the public must have confidence that the sentence is appropriate for the crime, and that does include punishment. And the trouble is, I'm afraid, that too often the response from ministers is simply to declare that the system's working fine and that everyone should just accept it. But CPOs aren't working fine. First Minister. I mean, they were an SNP creation and they're this government's policy. But we've learned again today that they're being applied to serious crimes like rape when they shouldn't be. Up to a third of them are breached and up to a fifth of them don't contain any punishment element at all. I believe that we now need a calm, considered, fresh review by the Scottish Government on the way that CPOs are being handed out. Will the First Minister take that action? Because it is so obviously needed. First Minister. Well, Firstly, again, can I say that the, the issue in this morning's media that has given rise to Ruth Davidson's uh, questions, I, I read that and, uh, of course, share the concern that many people will experience. But I would make a number of points uh, to Ruth Davidson. Uh, firstly, she may or, or may not be aware, that's not meant as, as any criticism, that there was an independent evaluation published in 2015 uh, of CPOs that showed that they are viewed with a degree of confidence uh, by most sheriffs and are seen as an improvement on previous community sentences. It's also the case, as I say, that uh, those uh, given a CPO are less likely to, to re-offend and be reconvicted. And again, we have statistics that bear that out. Uh, I think it's also important to say uh, that uh, CPOs can include electronic monitoring sanctions uh, if there is non-compliance with them. And anyone who breaches a CPO uh, and who fails uh, to take up the opportunity that a non-custodial sentence like that presents for them will find themselves facing sanctions. And those sanctions do include imprisonment. And in terms of the most recent figures uh, we have uh, for 2014-15, 17 uh, of CPOs were revoked due to them being breached. Now, again, trying to find a note of, of consensus here, I, I actually agree that when somebody commits a crime, as well as thinking about how we rehabilitate and reduce the risk of re-offending, of course there has to be a punishment element uh, to the sentence that is passed down. And we've got to, uh, in our policy framework, get that balance right. And then we have to entrust the decisions in individual cases uh, to the independent judges and sheriffs who make those decisions. My responsibility as First Minister, uh, and it's one I take very seriously, is to make sure we get the policy framework right. And in seeking to do that, we will always listen to views and we will certainly always look at the evidence that tell us whether or not non-custodial sentences are being effective or not. And I would hope all members across the chamber would 
would feed into that. But we must also accept that having set the policy framework and set the policy objectives, we must trust the independent judiciary to make the decisions that they deem appropriate in individual cases. It would be absolutely wrong. And I suspect, you know, in, in fairness, Ruth Davidson would probably be one of the first to, to say it was wrong if I, as First Minister, started to pass comment on the individual sentences passed down by judges. So I think we've got the right framework in place, but that is not to say that framework is perfect or that it can't be improved. And I want to say in all sincerity to members across this chamber that we will continue to consider and to evaluate uh, and where necessary to make changes in the interest of keeping the public safe and making sure we're doing what we need to do to reduce reoffending. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet Alzheimer's Scotland. First Minister. Well, with yesterday being World Alzheimer's Day, I'd want to pay tribute to the invaluable work that Alzheimer's Scotland and indeed other third sector organisations do to support people with dementia uh, and their carers in our local communities. The Minister for Mental Health will this afternoon speak at the annual National Dementia Awards. In addition, Alzheimer's Scotland's National Dementia Carers Action Network and the Scottish Dementia Working Group met with, uh, meet with the Minister for Mental Health at least twice a year. Kezia Dugdale. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Between 2010 and 2015, the Tories cut Scotland's block grant by 5%. That's an economic policy that damages our public services and increases the inequality in our country. And it's an economic policy that we should reject. Does the First Minister agree with me that this Parliament should act as a block to Tory cuts? First Minister. Uh, Kezia Dugdale knows that I agree with that, but Kezia Dugdale also knows, because we've discussed this many times in the past, that before we have a debate in this chamber about who in Scotland bears the burden of Tory austerity, we should first unite to try to stop Tory austerity happening in the first place. Now, Kezia Dugdale is right to point out that, according to the Fraser of Allender, report the Tories have cut Scotland's budget in the year since 2010 by 5% in real terms. Uh, but she'll also know that that report uh, looks to the future and says that there is a likelihood of further Tory cuts to Scotland's budget of up to £1.6 billion uh, by the end of this Parliament. Now, uh, we have a new Chancellor of the Exchequer who has said, and uh, I'm prepared at this stage to take him at his word, that he's going to reset economic policy. So I would hope that Kezia Dugdale would join with those of us on these benches to say to the Tories, put an end to austerity, put an end to austerity at source and do it now. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. I'm glad that the First Minister can agree with me that Tory cuts of 5% are unacceptable. So how can it be that today's Accounts Commission report shows that the SNP have cut local council funding, not by 5%, but by 11%. The SNP haven't just passed on Tory cuts, they have doubled Double. those Tory Double. cuts. And the report tells us who is paying the price. Older people who need help to get washed aren't getting it. Elderly folk who five years ago would have had help with their meals aren't getting it. The number of elderly Scots getting any care at all has fallen by 12%. And what's worse is that we know the SNP are planning more cuts to councils and cuts to councils are cuts to care. The First Minister has the power to stop these cuts. Why won't she use it? Well, First Minister. Of course, in terms of the most recent figures that we have available in terms of the outturn figures, social work spending has increased by 6% uh, in real terms since this government took office. Social care spending uh, has increased by 5% in real terms uh, since 2008-9. So both of these figures are from 2008-9 until the most recent figures we've got available. Uh, of course, in terms of the report published by the Accounts Commission today, it is an important report and it's got lots of, uh, I think, very important messages for all of us. Uh, it says if we keep doing things the same way as we are doing, then there will be an additional financial burden uh, on social care services by the end of this parliament but of course that's why uh, we have integrated health and social care the biggest reform uh, of health and social care services since the establishment of the national health service uh, making sure that we are finding better ways of delivering services uh, more prevention more community-based services uh, to reduce admissions to hospitals 
and care homes. And of course, it was in my party's manifesto, I don't think it was included in uh, Kezia Dugdale's manifesto, uh, that we're going to invest an additional £1.3 billion over this parliament in health and social care partnerships. The first instalment of that, of course, has been the £250 million transferred into health and social care partnerships in this financial year. Uh, so we know we face the challenge of an ageing population and we are determined on uh, this side of the chamber to face up to and work with local councils to address that challenge. But I think the question Kezia Dugdale has to answer is, is this one. She concedes the, the point. Kezia Dugdale concedes that one of the pressures, the biggest pressure on the Scottish Government budget is cuts being imposed by a Tory government. And yet, even although Kezia Dugdale accepts that the Tories, if Jeremy Corbyn is re-elected on Saturday, are going to be in power for many, many, many years, she simply expects us to shrug our shoulders and accept that. I don't think that's good enough. Kezia Dugdale. Officer, the First Minister tells the Chamber she's put £250 million extra into health and social care. What she forgot to tell the Chamber was she took £500 million out last year. And that's why we had to vote against our budget. And the truth is, the Accounts Commission report tells us that overall spending is falling, First Minister. In fact, it says that these cuts are unsustainable. And the truth is, they don't have to happen. I am only asking Nicola Sturgeon to do what she's wanted to do her entire political life, make different choices from the Tories. Yeah. So when she writes her budget in the coming weeks, the First Minister will face a choice. She can double down with even more cuts to care, or she can back Labour's plans to use the powers of this Parliament. What's it to be, First Minister? Kezia Dugdale doesn't oppose Tory austerity. She wants to shift the burden of Tory austerity onto working people the length and breadth of this country. And I would say to her, I would say to her, she put that proposition to the people of Scotland just four months ago, and she's sitting on that side of the chamber because her party came third in the Scottish Parliament election. Now, we will continue, we will continue to face up to the challenges, face up to the challenges in our social care services. That's why we've integrated health and social care, something that in all the years that Labour were in power, they shied away from doing. It's why we're taking the difficult steps of transferring resources from acute health services into health and social care partnerships to build up the capacity of our social care services and help to develop more community services to keep our older people, where appropriate, out of hospital and care homes and enable them to stay in their own homes. It's why we are taking all of these actions and why we will reflect very carefully on the Accounts Commission report to inform the decisions we continue to take. These are the serious decisions that this government will continue to take. But I say again to Kezia Dugdale, I would ask her to reflect on the position she and her party are in. She stands up uh, regularly and says that the future looks to be a Tory future in terms of the Westminster government. Uh, and yet she's got the nerve to come here uh, and lecture me about the implications of Tory cuts that her party are powerless to do anything about. The Labour Party. The Labour Party is a complete and utter shambles and perhaps should be taking more responsibility for the Tories' ability to continue to impose cuts on Scotland. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. Last week, a newspaper levelled a serious allegation against the Scottish Government. SNP pledged to sabotage cuts to benefits. For once in my life, presiding officer, I do hope the Daily Mail have it right. <laughs> the Scottish Greens have published detailed proposals showing how around 13,000 people a year could be protected from the benefit sanctions regime if devolved employment programmes refuse to cooperate with that sanctions programme. And so I welcome the words that we've heard from uh, Angela Constance, 
While we can't stop the UK government putting conditions on work-related benefits, we are not going to be giving them any information or responding to inquiries if we think that might lead to a sanction. I welcome that, but I'd like to understand the scope of it. Can the First Minister confirm, does that commitment go beyond the already announced voluntary schemes in relation to disabled people and people with long-term health conditions, or will this be the universal approach for all people participating in devolved uh, work programmes under the Scottish Government? First Minister. Well, can I thank Patrick Harvey for raising an important issue. I think Patrick Harvey uh, knows, and uh, the tenor of his question would suggest he knows, how serious the Scottish Government is in introducing a, a social security system with the limited social security powers we'll be getting that have dignity and humanity at their heart. Now, I think the sanctions regime imposed by the Tories in its current form it breaches those principles. And I know that from the many people I see in my surgeries, and we will all see these people uh, who have sanctions imposed on them uh, for reasons that they should never, ever uh, face uh, those circumstances. So as we develop the detail uh, of the system we're putting in place, then we want to make sure that we mitigate the effects of that as far as we possibly can um, and don't cooperate in uh, a scheme that is about piling human misery on human misery. Now, I, as Patrick Harvey knows, we have embarked on uh, consultations we, that will lead to a Social Security Act uh, bill rather in this uh, chamber uh, over the, the next year and the, the, the fine detail of that will flow from the, the consultation work we are doing. But the principles that Angela Constance has articulated are very, very clear and I look forward to having the uh, assistance and cooperation of Patrick Patrick Harvey and his colleagues and indeed uh, people from across the chamber or at least from uh, most parts of, of the chamber uh, in helping us put in place that system that in its detail lives up to the principles that we have articulated. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful for that answer and it does sound as though the First Minister has gone further than in the past. It does sound as though we're going to see employment programmes which are all voluntary and do not impose socially harmful and counterproductive sanctions on people in Scotland. Another aspect of the consultation the First Minister referred to is around young carers and the need to have an additional allowance that respects uh, and reflects their position in life and the work that they do. Does the First Minister also acknowledge that a great deal of the impact will be alleviated on them if we address the financial aspects and ensure that a young carer's allowance is seen in financial terms, not only in terms of benefits in kind? Uh, again, yes, I, I do agree with the, the thrust of Patrick Harvey's question. Um, in terms of employment programmes, the, the, the point of employment programmes should be to help people, genuinely help people into work, not to put in place a system full of tripwires that they fall over and end up uh, being sanctioned uh, as a result. And that will be the ethos behind uh, the devolved employment programmes that we put in place. In terms of the Young Carers Allowance, Patrick Harvey will know that uh, that was one of the, the things from, indeed, the Green Party's manifesto that we have agreed to consider. We are in the process of considering how that could best work to, to give effective help to young carers. And indeed, I was uh, just in the last couple of days reading an update on the discussions, early discussions we've had um, around the development of that policy. We haven't come to conclusions yet on what the best scheme would be, but we will do that uh, shortly. And uh, I look forward to uh, another policy uh, from this government that is about uh, recognising the work that carers do, in particular young carers, the impact their caring responsibilities have in their life and the responsibility of all of us uh, to help them uh, live a full life notwithstanding those responsibilities and again I look forward to the cooperation of Patrick Harvey and his colleagues as we develop that policy. Question number four, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Matters of importance to the people of Scotland. New figures show that children in Scotland can wait two years for mental health treatment. The Scottish Government promised they would receive treatment within 18 weeks. That promise has not been kept this year or last year. Why is the First Minister letting these children down? First Minister. Well, again, I would say to Willie Rennie, this is a, a really important issue. Um, I don't uh, agree with that characterisation. Scotland was actually the first country in the world, I think, to introduce a target for access uh, of children and adolescents to mental health treatment. We recognise uh, that we have more work to do to make sure that all children and young people get the access to mental health services that we think they deserve. Uh, we have been increasing investment in mental health services. Uh, we have been increasing the number of clinicians working in mental health services. Um, we've had uh, a, a substantial increase in the number of psychologists working with young people uh, with mental health issues. Of course, as I think we covered in uh, First Minister's question, 
sessions two weeks ago, we are seeing a significant rise in demand for those services. And while that puts pressure on services that we have a responsibility to meet, we should welcome that increase in demand in the, uh, to the extent that it shows that young people are now more able to come forward because the stigma around mental health is decreasing. So our mental health strategy, uh, which we will publish shortly, backed by £150 million pounds of new resources shows the seriousness with which we take this issue and we'll continue to take the steps to improve services so that all young people get access that they need and deserve. Really, really. The First Minister says the problem is that more young people are asking for help. It's not their problem, it's the government's problem for not being ready. We saw this coming. We have warned about this. We've got a plan to invest in primary care, emergency services and for young people. And what was the response? from the SNP government. It was to delay spending £70 million available for mental health support because they couldn't get their strategy agreed on time. Will the First Minister commit to spending that £70 million on services for young people today? First Minister. I think Willie Rennie is raising an important issue, but I do think he should try to engage with it in, in a way that will actually help all of us face up to and address this important issue. And the first thing that it's not fair of Willie Rennie, and I think anybody who's been watching this exchange uh, will know it was not fair for Willie Rennie to say that I described more young people coming forward for help as a problem. I didn't. I said actually that was a good thing that we should welcome. And I went on to say it was my responsibility and the responsibility of the government to make sure services can meet that increased demand. So I, I think to be fair, that uh, is, is what I said. I also uh, set out some of the actions we are taking. You know, Willie Rennie talks about spending. We have set out plans uh, to invest an additional £150 million in mental health services, uh, £54 million to reduce waiting times. Uh, we are going to uh, spend £10 million to uh, support new ways of improving mental health in primary care settings, something that, to be fair to Willie Rennie, he's repeatedly raised, uh, £15 million specifically to support better access to child and adolescent mental health services and a range of other initiatives that are all about recognising, positively recognising the increase in demand and making sure we're taking the steps to meet that demand. I absolutely accept it's uh, for the opposition parties to, to put pressure on the government, to scrutinise the government, to hold the, the government to account. But I also would hope that on this really vital issue, we can try to find uh, a degree of consensus as well. I think this is one of the most serious issues we face as a society, not just about treating young people with mental health uh, problems, but also preventing mental health problems. And there's a, a much bigger discussion, of course, that we could have about that. But the government is absolutely committed to the action we've set out. And I hope, I, I genuinely hope, we'll have the support of Willie Rennie uh, as we implement those actions. Supplementary from Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister if she agrees with me that depicting women who serve in public life as sexual predators or, and I quote, as poor excuses for women or refers to them with homophobic slurs can never be excused as amusing satire, but is in fact crass and deeply offensive. First Minister. Um, yes, I, I, I do. Um, I, I don't know specifically what comments uh, Annie Wells is, is referring to there, but um, I... If, if it is the, the, the incident at the weekend, then of course... Look, I, again, this is serious. I, as I hope everybody would know, even my sternest critics uh, would accept that I would never, ever condone homophobia. Uh, and I, I genuinely hope that there is nobody across this chamber that would argue with that. Some of the terminology we've, we've heard used in, in satire over recent days is, is terminology I would never use. It's terminology I don't condone and it's terminology I can well understand uh, that people would be offended by. I also though would say that you know, it's, it's not appropriate, I, I don't think, or not reasonable to describe, for example, a lesbian woman who's been out as a lesbian for 30 years because she personally isn't offended by some of that as, as homophobic. So let's all uh, unite in condemning homophobia uh, because that, I think, is what, uh, you know, we're just talking about mental health and some of the, uh, the, the reasons for, for mental health uh, problems with LGBT young people uh, come from homophobia and homophobic bullying. So let's 
you know, bring a bit of seriousness to this issue, uh, not use it all the time. And I, I take responsibility here, and these comments are targeted at, at me and my party as much as at anybody else's. But let's not use these things as often uh, to throw things at each other as politicians. Let's instead unite as a parliament to say that homophobia has no place in our society and we should all challenge it at all occasions. Supplementary from Jackie Bailey. The First Minister will be aware of the significant support for the Community Maternity Unit at the Vale of Leven Hospital, which I was pleased to visit with her in the past. Will she ensure that the Health Board's proposal to close the unit is designated as a major service change and therefore must be subject to sign-off by Scottish Ministers? First Minister. Well, as, as Jackie Bailey knows, uh, the, the decision about whether a particular service change is deemed a major service change is one that is taken in consultation with the Scottish Health Council. Those discussions are ongoing in terms of the changes uh, that Greater Glasgow and Clyde have put forward. And of course, the Health Secretary will ultimately make that determination once uh, that recommendation has come to her. Uh, the proposal that Jackie Bailey talks about, as well as some of the other service change proposals put forward by Greater Glasgow and Clyde, are proposals. Uh, they must be uh, consulted upon, they must be properly considered with the interests of patients absolutely at uh, their heart. Uh, and of course, where they are major service change, the ultimate decision uh, will lie with the Health Secretary. Um, Jackie Bailey talked about uh, our visit some years ago uh, to the Community Midwifery Service at uh, Maternity Unit, sorry, at the Vale of Leven Hospital. Uh, that was at the time, of course, when, as Health Secretary, uh, I was working hard to uh, secure and safeguard uh, the Vale of Leven, which, when uh, at the time I took office and this government took office, was under serious threat uh, from the Labour uh, administration that preceded us. So the Vale of Leven Hospital uh, got a future uh, because of the decisions this government will take, in, and we will always act in the interests of local health services. Supplementary from John Mason. A thank you. To ask the First Minister for her reaction to the death of a young boy outside his school in my constituency last week and whether she thinks that traffic exclusion zones around schools should be more widely considered. First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, can I say any loss of life on Scotland's road is a terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, but the death of a, a young child is especially poignant and our thoughts are with this young boy's family and friends at this uh, unimaginably awful time for them. It is, of course, for local authorities to decide on road safety measures around schools, uh, and they do so in consultation with parents and local residents and according to the specific circumstances in which schools are situated. Innovative measures such as the traffic exclusion zone uh, recently trialled in Haddington, uh, as I understand it, could certainly be part uh, of those considerations, and I would uh, encourage local authorities uh, where it's appropriate uh, to consider uh, proposals uh, like that, because one thing I, I think we would all agree is the safety of children it uh, must be absolutely paramount question number five kenneth gibson thank you presiding officer to ask the first minister what plans the scottish government has to honor scotland's paralympians first minister well first i'm sure everyone in the chamber and indeed across scotland uh, is proud of the achievements of the 33 scottish para athletes uh, who were part of team gb uh, and the 17 medals which they've brought uh, home to scotland with them uh, i'm certainly looking forward to welcoming home our paralympians and olympians at reception uh, next week at Orium, our new National Sports Performance Centre at Heriot Watt University. And that event will be followed by a public event at Festival Square here in Edinburgh. Um, I'm proud of, we're all proud of all of our uh, Paralympic athletes, but if I can maybe perhaps just make a special mention of Libby Clegg and Joe Butterfield, because as well as winning uh, their gold medals, of course, they both also set new world records, uh, something to be doubly proud of. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. I'm sure she will concur that the success of Team GB shows just how much hard work has been put in by coaches and athletes supported by their families. For Scotland to increase its medal tally from 11 in 2012 to 17 this year is truly heartening. As a strong supporter of this Ayrshire girl can, does the First Minister agree that the silver medal won by Abby Kane of Largs swimming the 100 metres backstroke is particularly inspirational? And to what extent will the new £12 million para sports facility now being built in Largs aid Scotland's future Paralympians? First Minister. Uh, well, I agree entirely uh, with Kenny Gibson's comments about Abby Kane. Uh, Abby Kane made Team GB at the age of uh, 13. That is an inspiration in itself. She then, of course, went on uh, to win a silver medal in Rio, which is absolutely 
fantastic. And I think she has uh, single-handedly uh, demonstrated to a whole generation of, of young people, and, and young girls in particular, uh, what they can achieve by hard work and dedication. So I absolutely uh, salute her prowess and uh, her, her bravery uh, and the sheer delight she's given us all uh, in the competition over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, in terms of investment, we've made a direct investment of £6 million into uh, the overall investment in Sports Scotland's National Centre uh, Inverclyde, which will open in spring uh, 2017. This fully inclusive facility has been designed to enable athletes to train and stay to specifically aid preparations for future games. And uh, I'm sure that's something uh, that Kenny Gibson will, will welcome. Uh, Importantly, the centre will also be available to members of the local community and therefore it will also provide a valuable asset to the area, to people who uh, may never be Olympic or Paralympic uh, athletes, but nevertheless enjoy and should be encouraged to enjoy sport. Question number 16, Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to reduce waiting times for young people referred to mental health services in Forth Valley and across Scotland. First Minister. Well, the continued increase in demand for mental health services for young people uh, shows, as I've just been saying, that in the past there were far too many children who were unseen and whose need was unmet. Uh, to respond to this, we have uh, doubled the number of psychologists working in CAM services. We're also investing, uh, again, as I've just said, an additional £150 million uh, over this Parliament uh, and we'll be publishing our new mental health strategy at the end of this year. Uh, the Minister for Mental Health has been clear with all NHS boards that uh, any falls in performance towards our target of 90% of young people being seen within 18 weeks is not good enough and that we need to improve that performance. Uh, our £150 million investments in, includes almost £5 million for a mental health access improvement team uh, and they have already started work with NHS Forth Valley. Jean Lockhart. I thank the First Minister for that response. Clearly, any additional support to urgently address this concerning situation is to be welcomed. However, as, been as has been mentioned, the, the 18, since the 18-week referral uh, time target was introduced in December 2014, the number of young people in NHS Forth Valley who started treatment within this time frame has fallen from 56% to only 28%, making this region one of the worst performing in Scotland. My concern, First Minister, is that this 28% is not just a number. It highlights that there are many young people who are in desperate need of support. This is the case not just in Forth Valley, but across many areas of Scotland. And evidence shows that over half of all diagnosable mental health problems start before the age of 14. So it is absolutely vital that young people in my region and in other areas get the help they so urgently need when they need it. Will the First Minister therefore listen to the calls from the Scottish Children's Coalition uh, Services to develop an urgent action plan for boards that need this urgent support, such as NHS Forth Valley? And it's not just a question of more money, it's a question of more expertise being made available. And will she encourage the Minister for Mental Health to join me and meet with the representatives from the Health Board to see how we can best address this urgent and concerning situation. First Minister. Uh, the Minister for Mental Health would be, uh, of course, happy to meet with the member uh, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss these issues with health boards on a, an ongoing basis. Uh, Dean Lockhart is, is absolutely right and I think it's something that I and, and all of us have to constantly remind ourselves of. We quote statistics, I regularly quote statistics in this chamber, we all do, but behind every one of these statistics is a, a human being and that's, uh, I think, a, a very uh, timely reminder for all of us. Um, that's why it is so important, uh, firstly, uh, not to see the increase in demand as a problem, but to see it as a sign that more young people are coming forward for help that previously they didn't get and then to recognise our responsibility to meet that demand. Uh, in terms of Forth Valley, the performance is unacceptable and that's been made clear to them. Uh, but Dean Lockhart is also right to make the point that it's not just about extra investment, although they are uh, receiving uh, help through extra investment, but it is also about uh, expertise, which is why uh, I'll uh, draw his attention to the, the last part of my first answer to him, that we have established a mental health access improvement team um, and that team has already started working with Forth Valley so that that expertise as well as the additional investment can be brought to bear in bringing uh, these waiting times down in the way that we expect to see. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I wonder whether the First Minister agree with me that it's probably high time that some members recognise that a huge effort has been put in on the ground to improve mental health services, particularly in Forth Valley. For instance, in Forth Valley, there's been a complete redesign of service with significant additional investment in CAMS, leading to a big increase in activity over the past year. Can the First Minister confirm what extra investment and support has been made 
to help our dedicated professionals who deserve our praise improve their service. First Minister. Uh, well, I think Bruce Crawford is, is also right that we, we have to remember the, the dedication of the, the people working in the front line here. They are uh, facing increased demand, uh, but the fact that waiting times in some areas are not as good as we would want them to be is not down uh, to, to any lack of dedication uh, or hard work on their part. That's why I come back to the point our responsibility is to increase capacity to meet that extra demand. Um, in terms of Fourth Valley, as I've already said, it's receiving support from uh, our new team and from Healthcare Improvement Scotland to help them deliver on their redesign. And Bruce Crawford is right to, to mention that redesign. We're also investing an additional £1.3 million in Forth Valley over the next four years to support reductions in waiting times specifically and a further £725,000 over three years to support innovation in the delivery of CAMS. And that's in addition to the half a million pounds provided this year to the board to support further development in specialist CAM services, uh, workforce and delivery. Uh, so there is intensive efforts being made to support those at the front line to deliver these services uh, and that will be replicated across Scotland in different ways so that we can see services uh, that are capable of meeting the increased demand uh, that young people uh, are, are creating by coming forward uh, because the stigma of mental health is thankfully beginning to reduce. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I agree with the First Minister that progress has been made to reduce the stigma around mental health, but we've heard about the, the increasing waiting times and there's no escaping that. And this week, the Scottish Health Survey revealed a postcode lottery with children and young people in the most deprived communities more likely to have lower levels of good mental health. Last week, 10,000 members of the 38 Degrees campaign group took the time to reply to the government's consultation, which closed on Friday, to say that more investment is required. Does the First Minister, um, whilst any additional funding is to be welcomed, does the First Minister share concerns that, that I do, that £150 million, which is over five years, might not be enough? And what steps will be taken uh, by the Mental Health Minister to keep that under review? First Minister. Well, firstly, um, Monica Lennon is right uh, in many of the, the points she's made there, particularly uh, to draw attention to uh, the, the link between deprivation and mental health, and that's something that is very, uh, very much in our minds as we develop the mental health strategy. She also uh, referred to uh, a number of people who have submitted uh, views to the, strat the, the strategy consultation, and those views will be taken into account. Um, the £150 million investment is for a, a range of targeted improvements to increase capacity and, and improve uh, waiting times. And, you know, this is not just about throwing a, a particular sum of money, it's about dedicated, targeted money to deliver specific improvements. Of course, we will keep that under review uh, as we uh, implement the, the new mental health strategy, uh, but there is an absolute determination on the part of the mental health minister and on the part of the government as a whole to make sure we have services in Scotland that increase, can meet the increased demand for mental health services. Uh, but I go back to something I said earlier on, which I think Monica Lennon was, was right to hint at, it's as much about prevention as it is about treatment. We've got a bigger debate, and we're not alone here, a bigger debate as a society about how we improve the mental well-being of young people, uh, not just treat the mental health problems of young people. And I hope that's something that this parliament, over the, the life of it, really can uh, get its teeth into. Mike Rumbles. Does the First Minister agree with me that the biggest single thing she could do to treat this issue is to have a specialist in every surgery across Scotland? That's the biggest spend to save initiative she could ever make. First Minister. Well, we do agree that there needs to be more services in primary care. I, I think I, I indicated that in a previous answer. Uh, so we are committed to more link workers working in uh, primary care settings uh, to improve the, uh, the, the experience that, that patients have there. So, you know, in, in principle, I, I do agree with the, the sentiment of the question. I'd simply caution against anybody in, in, in an issue that is as complex as this one in suggesting that there is one magic bullet solution. There are a whole range of things we need to do here to improve prevention, but also to improve treatment and access to services. That's why the comprehensive holistic strategy uh, that we produce by the end of this year is so important. At uh, the point raised by Mike Rumbles, we'll certainly have uh, a part to play in that, but there are a whole range of other things we need to do as well. That concludes First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. I would ask members to leave the chamber quite quietly.